Part three, chapter four of Lady Byron Vindicated A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four of these miscellaneous documents. Extract from Lord Byron's expunged letter to Murray. To Mr. Murray, Bologna, June seventh, eighteen nineteen before i left venice i had returned to you your late and mr hobhouse's sheets of one don't wait for further answers from me but address yours to venice as usual i know nothing of my own movements i may return there in a few days or not for some time all this depends on circumstances i left mr hopner very well my daughter allegra is well too and is growing pretty her hair is growing darker and her eyes are blue her temper and her ways mr hopner says are like mine as well as her features she will make in that case a manageable young lady i have never seen anything of ada the little electra of my mycenae but there will come a day of reckoning even if i should not live to see it i have at least seen shivered who was one of my assassins when that man was doing his worst to uproot my whole family tree branch and blossoms when after taking my retainer he went over to them when he was bringing desolation on my hearth and destruction on my household gods did he think that in less than three years a natural event a severe domestic but an expected and common calamity would lay his carcass in a cross-road or stamp his name in a verdict of lunacy did he who in his sexagenary dot 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 reflect or consider what my feelings must have been when wife and child and sister and name and fame and country were to be my sacrifice on his legal altar and this at a moment when my health was declining my fortune embarrassed and my mind had been shaken by many kinds of disappointment while i was yet young and might have reformed what might be wrong in my conduct and retrieved what was perplexing in my affairs but he is in his grave and what a long letter i have scribbled this ends chapter three part four of miscellaneous documents extract from lord byron's expunged letter to murray read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana part three section five of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five in this collection of miscellaneous documents extracts from blackwood's magazine in order that the reader may measure the change of moral tone with regard to lord byron wrought by the constant efforts of himself and his party we give the two following extracts from blackwood the first is blackwood in eighteen nineteen just after the publication of don juan the second is blackwood in eighteen twenty five Quote, in the composition of this work there is unquestionably a more thorough and intense infusion of genius and vice power and profligacy than in any poem which had ever before been written in the english or indeed in any other modern language had the wickedness been less inextricably mingled with the beauty and the grace and the strength of a most inimitable and incomprehensible muse our task would have been easy don juan is by far the most admirable specimen of the mixture of ease strength gaiety and seriousness extant in the whole body of english poetry the author has devoted his powers to the worst of purposes and passions and it increases his guilt and our sorrow that he has devoted them entire the moral strain of the whole poem is pitched in the lowest key love honor patriotism religion are mentioned only to be scoffed at as if their sole resting-place were or ought to be in the bosoms of fools 
it appears in short as if this miserable man having exhausted every species of sensual gratification having drained the cup of sin even to its bitterest dregs were resolved to show us that he is no longer a human being even in his frailties but a cool unconcerned fiend laughing with a detestable glee over the whole of the better and worse elements of which human life is composed treating well nigh with equal derision the most pure of virtues and the most odious of vices dead alike to the beauty of the one and the deformity of the other a mere heartless despiser of that frail but noble humanity whose type was never exhibited in a shape of more deplorable degradation than in his own contemptuously distinct delineation of himself to confess to his maker and weep over in secret agonies the wildest and most fantastic transgressions of heart and mind is the part of a conscious sinner in whom sin has not become the sole principle of life and action but to lay bare to the eye of man and of woman all the hidden convulsions of a wicked spirit and to do all this without one symptom of contrition remorse or hesitation with a calm careless ferociousness of contented and satisfied depravity this was an insult which no man of genius had ever before dared to put upon his creator or his species impiously railing against his god madly and meanly disloyal to his sovereign and his country and brutally outraging all the best feelings of female honor affection and confidence how small a part of chivalry is that which remains to the descendant of the byrons a gloomy visor and a deadly weapon those who are acquainted as who is not with the main incidents in the private life of lord byron and who have not seen this production will scarcely believe that malignity should have carried him so far as to make him commence a filthy and impious poem with an elaborate satire on the character and manners of his wife from whom even by his own confession he has been separated only in consequence of his own cruel and heartless misconduct it is in vain for lord byron to attempt in any way to justify his own behavior in that affair and now that he has so openly and audaciously invited inquiry and reproach we do not see any good reason why he should not be plainly told so by the general voice of his countrymen it would not be an easy matter to persuade any man who has any knowledge of the nature of woman that a female such as lord byron has himself described his wife to be would rashly or hastily or lightly separate herself from the love with which she had once been inspired for such a man as he is or was had he not heaped insult upon insult and scorn upon scorn had he not forced the iron of his contempt into her very soul there is no woman of delicacy and virtue as he admitted lady byron to be who would not have hoped all things and suffered all things from one her love of whom must have been interwoven with so many exalting elements of delicious pride and more delicious humility to offend the love of such a woman was wrong but it might be forgiven to desert her was unmanly but he might have returned and wiped for ever from her eyes the tears of her desertion but to injure and to desert and then to turn back and wound her widowed privacy with unhallowed strains of cold-blooded mockery was brutality fiendishly inexpiably mean for impurities there might be some possibility of pardon were they supposed to spring only from the reckless buoyancy of young blood and fiery passions for impiety there might at least be pity were it visible that the misery of the impious soul equalled its darkness but for offences such as this which cannot proceed either from the madness of sudden impulse or the bewildered agonies of doubt but which speak the wilful and determined spite of an unrepenting unsoftened smiling sarcastic joyous sinner there can be neither pity nor pardon our knowledge that it is committed by one of the most powerful intellects our island has ever produced 
lends intensity a thousandfold to the bitterness of our indignation every high thought that was ever kindled in our breasts by the muse of byron every pure and lofty feeling that ever responded from within us to the sweep of his majestic inspirations every remembered moment of admiration and enthusiasm is up in arms against him we look back with a mixture of wrath and scorn to the delight with which we suffered ourselves to be filled by one who all the while he was furnishing us with delight must we cannot doubt it have been mocking us with a cruel mockery less cruel only because less peculiar than that with which he has now turned him from the lurking place of his selfish and polluted exile to pour the pitiful chalice of his contumely on the surrendered devotion of a virgin bosom and the holy hopes of the mother of his child it is indeed a sad and a humiliating thing to know that in the same year there proceeded from the same pen two productions in all things so different as the fourth canto of child harold and his loathsome don juan we have mentioned one and all will admit the worst instance of the private malignity which has been embodied in so many passages of don juan and we are quite sure the lofty-minded and virtuous men whom lord byron has debased himself by insulting will close the volume which contains their own injuries with no feelings save those of pity for him that has inflicted them and for her who partakes so largely in the same injuries august eighteen nineteen and here is the blackwood extract from eighteen ninety five quote, we shall like all others who say anything about lord byron begin sans apologie with his personal character this is the great object of attack the constant theme of open vituperation to one set and the established mark for all the petty but deadly artillery of sneers shrugs groans to another two widely different matters however are generally we might say universally mixed up here the personal character of the man as proved by his course of life and his personal character as revealed in or guessed from his books nothing can be more unfair than the style in which this mixture is made use of is there a noble sentiment a lofty thought a sublime conception in the book ah yes is the answer but what of that it is only the roue byron that speaks is it a kind a generous act of the man mentioned yes yes comments the sage but only remember the atrocities of don juan depend on it this if it be true must have been a mere freak of caprice or perhaps a bit of vile hypocrisy salvation is thus shut out at either entrance the poet damns the man and the man damns the poet nobody will suspect us of being so absurd as to suppose that it is possible for people to draw no inferences as to the character of an author from his book or to shut entirely out of view in judging of a book that which they may happen to know about the man who writes it the cant of the day supposes such things to be practicable but they are not but what we complain of and scorn is the extent to which they are carried in the case of this particular individual as compared with others the imprudence with which things are at once assumed to be facts in regard to his private history and the absolute unfairness of never arguing from his writings to him but for evil take the man in the first place as unconnected in so far as we thus consider him with his works and ask what after all are the bad things we know of him was he dishonest or dishonourable had he ever done anything to forfeit or even endanger his rank as a gentleman most assuredly no such accusations have ever been maintained against lord byron the private nobleman although something of the sort may have been insinuated against the author but he was such a profligate in his morals that his name cannot be mentioned with anything like tolerance was he so indeed we should like extremely to have the catechizing of the individual man who says so 
that he indulged in sensual vices to some extent is certain and to be regretted and condemned but was he worse as to such matters than the enormous majority of those who join in the cry of horror upon this occasion we most assuredly believe exactly the reverse and we rest our belief upon very plain and intelligible grounds first we hold it impossible that the majority of mankind or that anything beyond a very small minority are or can be entitled to talk of sensual profligacy as having formed a part of the life and character of the man who dying at six and thirty bequeathed a collection of works such as byron's to the world secondly we hold it impossible that laying the extent of his intellectual labors out of the question and looking only to the nature of the intellect which generated and delighted in generating such beautiful and noble conceptions as are to be found in almost all lord byron's works we hold it impossible that very many men can be at once capable of comprehending these conceptions and entitled to consider sensual profligacy as having formed the principal or even a principal trait in lord byron's character thirdly and lastly we have never been able to hear any one fact established which could prove lord byron to deserve anything like the degree or even the kind of odium which has in regard to matters of this class been heaped upon his name we have no story of base unmanly seduction or false or villainous intrigue against him none whatever it seems to us quite clear that if he had been at all what is called in society an unprincipled sensualist there must have been many such stories authentic and authenticated but there are none such absolutely none his name has been coupled with the names of three four or more women of some rank but what kind of women every one of them in the first place about as old as himself in years and therefore a great deal older in character every one of them utterly battered in reputation long before he came into contact with them licentious unprincipled characterless women what father has ever reproached him with the ruin of his daughter what husband has denounced him as the destroyer of his peace let us not be mistaken we are not defending the offences of which lord byron unquestionably was guilty neither are we finding fault with those who after looking honestly within and around themselves condemn those offences no matter how severely but we are speaking of society in general as it now exists and we say that there is vile hypocrisy in the tone in which lord byron is talked of there we say that although all offences against purity of life are miserable things and condemnable things the degrees of guilt attached to different offences of this class are as widely different as are the degrees of guilt between an assault and a murder and we confess our belief that no man of byron's station or age could have run much risk in gaining a very bad name in society had a course of life similar to lord byron's been the only thing chargeable against him in so far as we know anything of that the last poem he wrote was produced upon his birthday not many weeks before he died we consider it as one of the finest and most touching effusions of his noble genius we think he who reads it and can ever after bring himself to regard even the worst transgressions that have been charged against lord byron with any feelings but those of humble sorrow and manly pity is not deserving of the name of man the deep and passionate struggles with the inferior elements of his nature and ours which it records the lofty thirsting after purity the heroic devotion of a soul half weary of life because unable to believe in its own powers to live up to what it so intensely felt to be and so reverentially honored as the right the whole picture of this mighty spirit often darkened but never sunk often erring but never ceasing to see and to worship the beauty of virtue the repentance of it the anguish the aspiration almost stilled in despair 
the whole of this is such a whole that we are sure no man can read these solemn verses too often and we recommend them for repetition as the best and most conclusive of all possible answers whenever the name of byron is insulted by those who permit themselves to forget nothing either in his life or in his writings but the good this ends chapter three part five extracts from blackwood's magazine read Part three, chapter six of Lady Byron Vindicated, a history of the Byron controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six of this collection of miscellaneous documents. Letters of Lady Byron to H. C. Robinson. The following letters of Lady Byron's are reprinted from the memoirs of H. C. Robinson. They are given that the reader may form some judgment of the strength and activity of her mind and the elevated class of subjects upon which it habitually dwelt. Lady Byron to H. C. R., December 31st, 1853. Dear Mr. Crabb Robinson, I have an inclination, if I were not afraid of trespassing on your time, but you can put my letter by for any leisure moment, to enter upon the history of a character which I think less appreciated than it ought to be. Men, I observe, do not understand men in certain points without a woman's interpretation. Those points, of course, relate to feeling. Here is a man taken by most of those who come his way, either for dry as dust, matter of fact, or for vain visionary. There are doubtless some defective or excessive characteristics which give rise to those impressions. My acquaintance with Dr. King was made, oddly enough, twenty-seven years ago. A pauper said to me of him, "'He's the poor man's doctor.' Such a recommendation seemed to me a good one, and I also knew that his organizing head had formed the first district society in England, for Mrs. Fry told me she could not have effected it without his aid, yet he has always ignored his own share of it. I felt in him at once the curious combination of the Christian and the cynic, of reverence for man and contempt of men. It was then an internal war, but one in which it was evident to me that the holier cause would be victorious, because there was deep belief, and, as far as I could learn, a blameless and benevolent life. He appeared only to want sunshine. It was a plant which could not be brought to perfection in darkness. He had begun life by the most painful conflict between filial duty and conscience, a large provision in the church secured for him by his father, but he could not sign. There was discredit, as you know, attached to such scruples. He was also, when I first knew him, under other circumstances of a nature to depress him and to make him feel that he was unjustly treated. The gradual removal of these called forth his better nature in thankfulness to God. Still, the old misanthropic modes of expressing himself obtruded themselves at times. This passed in forty-eight between him and Robertson. Robertson said to me, I want to know something about ragged schools. I replied, You had better ask Dr. King. He knows more about them. I, said Dr. King, I take care to know nothing of ragged schools, lest they should make me ragged. Robertson did not see through it. Perhaps I had been taught to understand such suicidal speeches by my cousin, Lord Melbourne. The example of Christ, imperfectly as it may be understood by him, has been ever before his eyes. He woke to the thought of following it, and he went to rest consoled or rebuked by it. After nearly thirty years of intimacy, I may without presumption form that opinion." There is something pathetic to me in seeing any one so unknown. 
even the other medical friends of robertson when i knew that dr king felt a woman's tenderness said on one occasion to him but we know that you dr king are above all feeling if i have made the character more consistent to you by putting in these bits of mosaic my pen will not have been ill-employed nor unpleasing to you yours truly a noel byron next letter lady byron to h c r brighton november fifteenth eighteen fifty four the thought of all this public and private suffering have taken the life out of my pen when i tried to write on matters which would otherwise have been most interesting to me these seemed the shadows that the stern reality it is good however to be drawn out of scenes in which one is absorbed most unprofitably and to have one's natural interests revived by such a letter as i have to thank you for as well as its predecessor you touch upon the very points which do interest me the most habitually the change of form and enlargement of design in the perspective had led me to express to one of the promoters of that object my desire to contribute the religious crisis is instant but the man for it the next best thing if as i believe he is not to be found in england is an association of such men as are to edit the new periodical an address delivered by freeman clark at boston last may makes me think him better fitted for a leader than any other of the religious freethinkers i wish i could send you my one copy but you do not need it and others do his object is the same as that of the alliance universelle only he is still more free from partialism his own word in his aspirations and practical suggestions with respect to an ultimate christian synthesis he so far adopts kant's theory as to speak of religion itself under three successive aspects historically one thesis two antithesis three synthesis i made his acquaintance in england and he inspired confidence at once by his brave independence in contus capillus and self-unconsciousness j j taylor's address of last month follows in the same path all in favor of irenics instead of polemics the answer which you gave me so fully and distinctly to the questions i proposed for your consideration was of value in turning to my view certain aspects of the case which i had not observed before i had begun a second attack on your patience when all was forgotten in the news of the day next letter lady byron to h c r brighton december twenty fifth eighteen fifty four with j j taylor though almost a stranger to him i have a peculiar reason for sympathizing a book of his was a treasure to my daughter on her deathbed footnote probably the christian aspects of faith and duty mr taylor has also written a retrospect of the religious life of england and footnote i must confess to intolerance of opinion as to these two points eternal evil in any form and involved in it eternal suffering to believe in these would take away my god who is all-loving with a god with whom omnipotence and omniscience were all evil might be eternal but why do i say to you what has been better said elsewhere End quote. next letter lady byron to h c r brighton january thirty first eighteen fifty five the great difficulty in respect to the national review seems to be to settle a basis inclusive and exclusive in short a boundary question from what you said i think you agreed with me that a latitudinarian christianity ought to be the character of the periodical but the depth of the roots should correspond with the width of the branches of that tree of knowledge of some of those minds one might say they have no root and then the richer the foliage the more danger that the trunk will fall 
grounded in christ has to me a most practical significance and value i too have anxiety about a friend miss carpenter whose life is of public importance she more than any of the english reformers unless nash and wright has found the art of drawing out the good of human nature and proving its existence she makes these discoveries by the light of love i hope she may recover from today's report the object of the reformatory in leicester has just been secured at a county meeting now the desideratum is well qualified masters and mistresses if you hear of such by chance pray let me know the regular schoolmaster is an extinguisher heart and familiarity with the class to be educated are all important at home and abroad the evidence is conclusive on that point for i have for many years attended to such experiments in various parts of europe the irish quarterly has taken up the subject with rather more zeal than judgment i had hoped that a sound and temperate exposition of the facts might form an article in the might have been review next letter lady byron to h c r brighton february twelfth eighteen fifty five i have at last earned the pleasure of writing to you by having settled troublesome matters of little moment except locally and i gladly take a wider range by sympathizing in your interests there is besides no responsibility for me at least in canvassing the merits of russell or palmerston but much in deciding whether the village politician jackson or thompson shall be leader in the school or public house has not the nation been brought to a conviction that the system should be broken up and is lord palmerston who has used it so long and so cleverly likely to promote that object but whatever obstacles there may be in state affairs that general persuasion must modify other departments of action and knowledge unroasted coffee will no longer be accepted under the official seal another reason for a new literary combination for distinct special objects a review in which every separate article should be convergent if instead of the problem to make a circle pass through three given points it were required to find the center from which to describe a circle through any three articles in the edinburgh or westminster review who would accomplish it much force is lost for want of this one-mindedness among the contributors it would not exclude variety or freedom in the unlimited discussion of means towards the ends unequivocally recognized if st paul had edited a review he might have admitted peter as well as luke or barnabas ross gave us an excellent sermon yesterday on hallowing the name though far from commonplace it might have been delivered in any church we have had fanny kimball here last week i only heard her romeo and juliet not less instructive as her readings always are than exciting for in her glass shakespeare is a philosopher i know her and honor her for her truthfulness amidst all trials next letter lady byron to h c r brighton march fifth eighteen fifty five i recollect only those passages of dr kennedy's book which bear upon the opinions of lord byron strange as it may seem dr kennedy is most faithful where you doubt his being so not merely from casual expressions but from the whole tenor of lord byron's feelings i could not but conclude he was a believer in the inspiration of the bible and had the gloomiest calvinistic tenets to that unhappy view of the relation of the creature to the creator i have always ascribed the misery of byron's life it is enough for me to remember that he who thinks his transgressions beyond forgiveness and such was his own deepest feeling has righteousness beyond that of the self-satisfied sinner or perhaps of the half-awakened 
it was impossible for me to doubt that could he have been at once assured of pardon his living faith in a moral duty and love of virtue i love the virtues which i cannot claim he said would have conquered every temptation judge then how i must hate the creed which made him see god as an avenger not a father my own impressions were just the reverse but could have little weight and it was in vain to seek to turn his thoughts for long from that id fix with which he connected his physical peculiarity as a stamp instead of being made happier by any apparent good he felt convinced that every blessing would be turned into a curse to him who possessed by such ideas could lead a life of love and service to god or man they must in a measure realize themselves the worst of it is i do believe he said i like all connected with him was broken against the rock of predestination i may be pardoned for referring to his frequent expression of the sentiment that i was only sent to show him the happiness he was forbidden to enjoy you will now better understand why the deformed transformed is too painful to me for discussion since writing the above i have read dr granville's letter on the emperor of russia some passages of which seem applicable to the prepossession i have described i will not mix up less serious matters with these which forty years have not made less than present still to me next letter lady byron to h c r brighton april eighth eighteen fifty five the book which has interested me most lately is that on mosaism translated by miss goldsmid and which i read as you will believe without any christian unchristian prejudice the missionaries of the unity were always from my childhood regarded by me as in that sense the people and i believe they were true to that mission though blind intellectually in demanding the crucifixion the present aspect of jewish opinions as shown in that book is all but christian the author is under the error of taking as the representatives of christianity the mystics ascetics and quietists and therefore he does not know how near he is to the true spirit of the gospel if you should happen to see miss goldsmid pray tell her what a great service i think she has rendered to the soi distant christians in translating a book which must make us sensible of the little we have done and the much we have to do to justify our preference of the later to the earlier dispensation next letter lady byron to h c r brighton april eleventh eighteen fifty five you appear to have more definite information respecting the review than i have obtained it was also said that the review would in fact be the prospective amplified not satisfactory to me because i have always thought that periodical too unitarian in the sense of separating itself from other christian churches if not by a high wall at least by a wire gauze fence now separation is to me the apoetic the revelation through nature never separates it is the revelation through the book which separates Quewell and brewster would have been one had they not i think equally dimmed their lamps of science when reading their bibles as long as we think a truth better for being shut up in a text we are not of the wide world religion which is to include all in one fold for that text will not be accepted by the followers of other books or students of the same and separation will ensue the christian scripture should be dear to us not as the charter of a few but of mankind and to fashion it into cages is to deny its ultimate objects these thoughts hot like the roll at breakfast where your letter was so welcome an addition this ends section six of miscellaneous doc
Chapter Three, Part Seven of Lady Byron Vindicated: A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Seven of these miscellaneous documents: Three Domestic Poems by Lord Byron. Fare thee well. A sketch and lines on hearing that Lady Byron was ill. Fare thee well. Fare thee well, and if forever, still forever, fare thee well. Even though unforgiving, ne'er against thee shall my heart rebel. Would that breast were bared before thee, where thy head so oft hath lain, while that placid sleep came o'er thee, which thou ne'er canst know again. Would that breast by thee glanced over, every inmost thought could show, then thou wouldst at last discover twas not well to spurn it so though the world for this commend thee though it smile upon the blow even its praises must offend thee found it on another's woe though my many faults defaced me could no other arm be found than the one which once embraced me to inflict a cureless wound Yet, oh, yet, thyself deceive not. Love may sink by slow decay. But by sudden wrench, believe not, hearts can thus be torn away. Still thine own its life retaineth, still must mine, though bleeding beat. And the undying thought which paineth is that we no more may meet. These are words of deeper sorrow than the wail above the dead. Both shall live, but every morrow wake us from a widowed bed. And when thou wouldst solace gather, when our child's first accents flow, wilt thou teach her to say father, though his care she must forgo? When her little hand shall press thee, when her lip to thine is pressed, Think of him whose prayer shall bless thee. Think of him thy love had blessed. Should her lineaments resemble those thou never more mayst see, then thy heart will softly tremble with a pulse yet true to me. All my faults perchance thou knowest, all my madness none can know. All my hopes, where'er thou goest, whither, yet with thee they go. Every feeling hath been shaken, pride which not a world could bow, bows to thee, by thee forsaken, even my soul forsakes me now. But tis done, all words are idle, words from me are vainer still, but the thoughts we cannot bridle force their way without the will. Fare thee well, thus disunited. Torn from every nearer tie, Seared in heart, and lone and blighted, More than this I scarce can die. A Sketch Born in the garret, in the kitchen bread, Promoted thence to deck her mistress' head, Next, for some gracious service unexpressed, And from its wages only to be guessed, Raised from the toilet to the table, Where her wondering betters wait behind her chair. With eye unmoved and forehead unabashed, She dines from off the plate she lately washed. Quick with the tale and ready with the lie, The genial confidant and general spy, Who could ye gods her next employment guess, And only infant's earliest governess? She taught the child to read, and taught so well, That she herself, by teaching, learned to spell. An adept next in penmanship she grows, As many a nameless slander deftly shows. What she had made the pupil of her art, none know. But that high soul secured the heart, And panted for the truth it could not hear, With longing breast and undiluted ear. Foiled was perversion by that youthful mind, Which flattery fooled not, 
baseness could not blind deceit infect not near contagion soil indulgence weaken nor example spoil nor mastered science tempt her to look down on humbler talents with a pitying frown nor genius swell nor beauty render vain nor envy ruffle to retaliate pain nor fortune change pride raise nor passion bow nor virtue teach austerity till now serenely purest of her sex that live but wanting one sweet weakness to forgive too shocked at faults her soul can never know she deems that all could be like her below foe to all vice yet hardly virtue's friend for virtue pardons those she would amend but to the theme now laid aside too long the baleful burthen of this honest song though all her former functions are no more she rules the circle which she served before if mothers none know why before her quake if daughters dread her for the mother's sake if early habits those false links which bind at times the loftiest to the meanest mind have given her power too deeply to instil the angry essence of her deadly will if like a snake she steal within your walls till the black slime betrays her as she crawls if like a viper to the heart she wind and leave the venom there she did not find what marvel that this hag of hatred works eternal evil latent as she lurks to make a pandemonium where she dwells and reign the hecate of domestic hells skilled by a touch to deepen scandal's tints with all the kind mendacity of hints while mingling truth with falsehood sneers with smiles a thread of candor with a web of wiles a plain blunt show of briefly spoken seeming to hide her bloodless heart's soul-hardened scheming a lip of lies a face formed to conceal and without feeling mock at all who feel with a vile mask the gorgon would disown a cheek of parchment and an eye of stone mark how the channels of her yellow blood ooze to her skin and stagnate there to mud cased like the centipede in saffron mail or darker greenness of the scorpion scale for drawn from reptiles only may we trace congenial colors in that soul or face look on her features and behold her mind as in a mirror of itself defined look on the picture deem it not o'ercharged there is no trait which might not be enlarged yet true to nature's journeymen who made this monster when their mistress left off trade this female dog-star of her little sky where all beneath her influence droop or die o oh, wretch without a tear without a thought save joy above the ruin thou hast wrought the time shall come nor long remote when thou shalt feel far more than thou inflictest now feel for thy vile self-loving self in vain and turn thee howling in unpitied pain may the strong curse of crushed affections light back on thy bosom with reflected blight and make thee in thy leprosy of mind as loathsome to thyself as to mankind till all thy self-thoughts curdle into hate black as thy will for others would create till thy hard heart be calcined into dust and thy soul welter in its hideous crust oh may thy grave be sleepless as the bed the widowed couch of fire that thou hast spread then when thou fain wouldst weary heaven with prayer look on thine earthly victims and despair down to the dust and as thou rottest away even worms shall perish on thy poisonous clay 
but for the love i bore and still must bear to her thy malice from all ties would tear thy name thy human name to every eye the climax of all scorn should hang on high exalted o'er thy less abhorred compeers and festering in the infamy of years <sighs> lines on hearing that lady byron was ill and thou wert sad yet i was not with thee and thou wert sick and yet i was not near methought that joy and health alone could be where i was not and pain and sorrow here and is it thus it is as i foretold and shall be more so for the mind recoils upon itself, and the wrecked heart lies cold, while heaviness collects the shattered spoils. It is not in the storm, nor in the strife, we feel benumbed, and wish to be no more, but in the after-silence on the shore, when all is lost except a little life. I am too well avenged, but t'was my right— Whatever my sins might be, thou wert not sent to be the nemesis who should requite, nor did heaven choose so near an instrument. Mercy is for the merciful, if thou hadst been of such, twill be accorded now. Thy nights are banished from the realms of sleep. Yes, they may flatter thee, but thou shalt feel a hollow agony which will not heal, for thou art pillowed on a curse too deep. Thou hast sown in my sorrow, and must reap the bitter harvest in a woe as real. I have had many foes, but none like thee, for against the rest myself I could defend, and be avenged, or turn them into friend. But thou, in safe implacability, hast not to dread, in thy own weakness shielded, and in my love, which hath but too much yielded, and spared for thy sake. Some I should not spare. And thus upon the world, trust in thy truth, and the wild fame of my ungoverned youth, on things that were not, and on things that are, even upon such a basis hast thou built a monument whose cement hath been guilt the moral Clytemnestra of thy lord, and hewed down with an unsuspected sword, fame, peace, and hope, and all the better life, which, but for this cold treason of thy heart, might still have risen from out the grave of strife, and found a nobler duty than to part. But of thy virtues didst thou make a vice, trafficking with them in a purpose cold for present anger and for future gold and buying others grief at any price and thus once entered into crooked ways the early truth which was thy proper praise did not still walk beside thee but at times and with a breast unknowing its own crimes deceit averments incompatible equivocations and the thoughts which dwell in janus spirits the significant eye which learns to lie with silence the pretext of prudence with advantages annexed the acquiescence in all things which tend no matter how to the desired end all found a place in thy philosophy the means were worthy and the end is won I would not do by thee as thou hast done. This ends chapter 3, part 7, Domestic Poems by Lord Byron. And this ends Lady Byron Vindicated, A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe.